This is Bishop Michael Burbage, and you are listening to the Walk Humbly Podcast. Welcome to the Walk Humbly Podcast. I'm Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese and your co-host. If you haven't already, please make sure you rate this podcast and even think about writing a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Overcast, and we're now on Spotify as well. Sign up for our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org, and you can follow Bishop Burbage on Twitter. More than 16,500 of you already do at Bishop Burbage. You can follow the diocese on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Send your questions to us. Email info at arlingtondiocese.org. Again, if you have a question for Bishop Burbage on this podcast, email us at info at arlingtondiocese.org. I welcome your host, Bishop Burbage. Bishop, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Billy, and uh, thanks to all of our listeners, and hope the summer continues to be uh, providing some time for rest and renewal. Absolutely. So before we get started, uh, ESPN re- recently ran a story both on television and online about Shelly Pennefather, the star Villanova basketball player who later became Sister Rose Marie of the Poor Clares here in our area. You saw the story. You actually mentioned in the online version of it. What did you, uh, what did you think of that? So it was a wonderful celebration. Uh, Sister Rose Marie of the Poor Clares in Alexandria was celebrating her 25th anniversary, her, her jubilee. Yeah. And I was invited uh, by the sisters to celebrate uh, the Mass and Thanksgiving for her a beautiful vocation. And they told me, the sisters told me, uh, that ESPN uh, uh, was going to be there. And I said, oh, you mean EWTN? And they go, <laughs> no, I, we mean ESPN. I go, the Sports Network? And the story, many of our listeners know, is sister was a, a star basketball player, Villanova, uh, was one at one point that won the best players, basketball players in the world. Yeah, she was and, highly paid, she oh, had a very lucrative career. Oh, yes. Uh, and so, but she heard God's call to leave all behind, literally. Yeah. Uh, and enter into a monastic life. And uh, so sister was celebrating her 25th year. They did a, a, a little documentary on that. It's really well done. Mm-hmm. And it shows the very close connection of, of a sister and her coach right. who visits her each year. Uh, but what was very special about the, this uh, celebration was because the sisters uh, live in Cloister, it was the first time in 25 years uh, that the doors were opened, and her mom, sister's mom, and sister were able to embrace. Yeah, it was a very as as she was with some of her immediate family members and her coach. It was a very very powerful moment. But as I always say, uh, when I visit our sisters, our Dominicans, our poor Claires, uh, those in Cloister, uh, it's it, it's so contrary to what the world thinks, right? The world thinks we need all these things. Uh, to be happy and Billy whenever I visit these sisters the joy and the serenity that they radiate uh, is just so inspirational Uh, and it's a reminder that in in Christ uh, we do have everything that we need and we are so thankful to the sisters for their witness and they pray for us they pray for our diocese uh, many in our diocese constantly petition the sisters for prayers for themselves, for their family members. We pray to them, asking them to pray for our vocations, and we are the recipients of, of all their prayers, and we're so grateful that they're in our diocese. That prayer is the core of their vocation, right, to pray absolutely. for the diocese. That's, yeah. m- that's wonderful. All day, all night. You yeah, know? absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it's a very, very tough life. Um, Bishop, as we've seen this past week, there were two shootings in two days that took the lives of 29 people and injured many more. The communities of El Paso and Dayton, they're still reeling uh, from this painful impact. The more we learn about the shooters, the more they fit a, a profile that we've seen for other mass shooters. Um, you know, troubled young men with broken families, uh, you know, warning signs in their past. One even published a, a racist manifesto just before going on this rampage. What stands out to you about this tragedy? Well, first of all, I am sure with uh, all of our our listeners is just the heartfelt uh, sympathy uh, that we extend uh, to their family members uh, to to lose loved ones in such a senseless, uh, tragic acts of of violence. Uh, It it just is gut wrenching. And and so we are, you know, united in extending our sympathy and assuring our prayers and and in our sadness, right? I'm sure all of us, uh, as these uh, acts of violence and shootings and killings are reported, it, it is just uh, so alarming. It's so sad 
uh, that we are living at a time and in a, a society uh, where so unfortunately it, it's almost as if we're hearing something every day not just in these recent ones but the violence mm -hmm. in, in communities throughout our nation yeah and and y you know when you start listening and 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 hearing some of the research and all it's been happening for a long time yeah in the last four decades really uh the violence is just increasing so there's nothing i'm going to say in this podcast that uh is going to be you know the you know the right thought or the perfect answer or solution i'm just sharing my sentiments um and i sure what i just said uh, are, are the feelings and sentiments of, of all but uh we we have to also acknowledge that what we're seeing it, it has to be viewed in light of the fact of what has happened over these decades too in the lack of, of, of the sacredness and the protection of all human life from the moment of conception. We don't get it right in the beginning. We're not going to get this right. From the moment That's of conception true. to natural death. Uh, we're living in a society where we, we have seen uh, that sacredness just, just you know, uh, decrease and uh, be limited. And we're, we're, we're constantly talking about it. Uh, but when there's not a sacredness of human life, uh, it, it's going to show itself. Uh, and the same thing with the dignity of each and every human person. It, it's the gospel mandate. But we all know that we're living in a society where that respect for others uh, is not always there. And so we're, we're hearing, um, you know, labeling and uh, putting people in categories uh, so, so tragically, hearing racist remarks. We're seeing bigotry and uh, white supremacy, all, all these things. Uh, are, what is that a lack of? A lack of reverence for human life, respect for the dignity of human person. So they must be condemned um, in every form. And we have to be a people uh, who are proclaiming, uh, you know, uh, the exact opposite, the gospel of life. Um, now, that, again, like I said in the beginning, this, you know, this, this, problem uh, th th that we've been witnessing and seeing recently and especially in the, in the incidents you just mentioned it's a very complex issue yeah uh, but certainly you know that that's at the heart of it we have to of course you know look at you know our the gun control and mm -hmm. you know what what is the way uh, to reasonably you know address this situation issues that's what we hope our elected officials are doing that they're they're meeting at a time of crisis uh, and put aside all the politics and all those things and come up let, let's do something uh, you know let's let's pray for them that they will have the wisdom that they need and I think we need experts involved uh, it, you mentioned in, in mental health issues and psychological issues and we need experts no one person or no one group of people it's not it's not a certain uh, part of society who's responsible for this all of us are Mm -hmm. So, no, you're right that there's a, a cultural component to it. It's when you think about the role that the faithful can have. You know, politicians are using this situation to score political points and to jab at their rivals. But people of faith, we have a faith that believes we can address these root issues. You right. know, we can help. We, we we think about the individual first in creating a culture of life where this kind of thing would stand out. But when, between you know abortion or whether it's euthanasia or assisted suicide, all these things that, that people think about, the, the you know, racism labeling, that's all a degradation of what God has given in the right. gift of that person. And that a culture-wide shift is where you would see change. And I think Catholics and the laity, by injecting that, that faith, could have real impact. Well, absolutely. And, and that's what we're always called to do, is to bring our faith into the public arena. I mean, even entertainment. Uh, yeah. Prom uh, uh, music, right? Promotion of violence, promotion of guns, mm -hmm. uh, and violence, uh, and you know all these, uh, you know, programs and all that have people screaming at one another. And yeah. So I mean, we all share uh, a responsibility here. So what? Thanks for bringing that up. But what, so what do we do? You know, people ask me that. You know, so what do we do in in, in the midst of this? Uh, well, the first of all, we don't despair. All right, because we believe that, that Christ has triumphed over evil. And all he asks us to do is participate in his life so goodness can win, so truth can win. So we can do our part. Uh, we can do our part by uh, promoting uh, and, and living according to the gospel of life, revering all of life, treating all persons with dignity, 
uh, in our own conversations and dialogues with family members, uh, with coworkers, with communities, neighbors, always to be respectful. And people always talk about tolerance, uh, but so sadly, it means tolerance until you disagree with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, then, and then anything goes. Right. And then you can be put into, you, you're labeled. And, uh, you know, so we all can do our part in giving that example and the witness that we need. We have to be attentive, you know, that when we see people who are crying out for help, uh, yeah. You know, that we're attentive to that, that we're, we're agents who, who may be able to identify that and, and point people in, in, the right, in the right direction. So, so many times we go through a day uh, without our eyes wide open uh, to the person next to me, you know, who, who's at the doorstep, who is really alone or lonely or angry or sad. You know, what, what can we do to, to be of help to those uh, t- to people? So, and, and of course, what can we do? We also must pray. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if God can do things that we can't do for ourselves. And so we need to entrust the victims. We need to trust our intention for the eradication of all such violence and evil to the Lord. I'll be offering a mass on Friday at our cathedral. Uh, for those intentions. I've asked the priests in, in, in our diocese to continue to keep in our petitions uh, the prayers of not, uh, for our victims and their families, but also the end of all such such violence. Yeah, so that Mass for everyone listening is at 12.05 p.m., so right around noon on Friday uh, here at uh, St. Thomas More Cathedral. It's uh, right on the grounds where the diocesan buildings are at the corner of 50 and North Glebe. We encourage anyone who's able to please come uh, attend and pray for victims of violence. Bishops, it's not at all uncommon for uh, priests to write letters to their parishioners. You write letters to your priest and to the faithful for different reasons. Recently, however, Pope Francis wrote a letter to priests in light of the abuse crisis. It was very unique and a fascinating letter to read. Would you summarize what the letter contains and, and your reaction to it? Yeah, I'm very, very happy uh, to, to receive the letter from our Holy Father addressed to all priests and thus with bishops, because bishops mm-hmm. are priests, though. Uh, <laughs> so very, very happy uh, to receive the letter and our uh, I, I, and I think the timing is, is very good. Our Holy Father, uh, as a spiritual father, uh, has been very good in, in challenging um, bishops and priests uh, to live in a manner worthy of the call we have received, to live lives of holiness and faithfulness and integrity, uh, to, be who, to, to be who we say we are, and to avoid the traps, the trappings of clericalism and um, that I'm here to receive instead of to give. And so he has been like, like many of our parents who are listening, right? You want the best for your children. And so you must appropriately challenge them and raise the bar because you love them. And right. You don't want them to stay where they are. You want them to always grow. So I say our Holy Father uh, throughout his ministry has been very good that way, very challenging. But in this letter, it, it, it's, it, it's more what parents also have to do. It can't always be challenging. There needs to be the time of acknowledging, you know, the good you're doing and um, encouraging. And I think that's what the Holy Father does in this letter. He recognizes that uh, this has been a very, very difficult time in the life of the church as we are aware of the abuse crisis and how that has impacted, of course, always first of all, the victims who we continue to extend our deepest regrets and apologies and willingness to support them in their healing but is also impacted um, the church, of course, but also priests. And, you know, I think our Holy Father has, has recognized in this letter, I know this has taken a toll on you. Uh, you are the priest, and this is, you know, it's, it's, it's the majority of priests who every single day, you know, get up and do what they promised God they were going to do. And they're, and they're being faithful, and they're being prayerful, and they're out there serving God's people. And I think our Holy Father is saying, but I guess this has taken a toll on you because when one priest has failed, we're all, in a sense, responsible and we're lumped together. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, it, 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 people understand this. It's, it's, you know, if you're, if you're working for a company or company makes a major mistake, well, everyone associated with that is kind of, well, it's, it's your fault too. And that begins to take a toll. And I think priests have, have felt that, you know, that, you know, because of the mistakes of brothers, maybe years ago or that that you know now i'm looked at that way even though i never done this and i so our holy father says so do not despair what we were just saying later do not get discouraged 
You, you, are, you are chosen by the Lord. You are his priest. Find your strength in him and in doing his work. You have a beautiful vocation. Live it. Uh, and if it brings a cross with it, know that God will give you the, the cross to, to uh, carry. And then he says, and be grateful. Yeah, he, he has a whole section on be gratitude. Grateful. Be very grateful. Good. Be grateful for the vocation that's yours. The Lord has given you a beautiful vocation. Give thanks for it. Don't take it for granted. And, you know, it's great advice to anyone, married couples, yeah. or, or whatever vocation God has given to us. This is what the Lord has asked for us. Don't take it for granted. Be grateful. So I think our Holy Father's words just came at a, a really, really good time. Uh, I think he, um, he, he, he gave his priests uh, the encouragement that we need as, as him speaking to us as, as our spiritual father. If I could just read to our listeners, um, you know, just the, the very ending of, of, the, of the letter, and I think it, it sets the tone for what our Holy Father has said uh, to, to his priests. He closes um, in this way. He says, May we allow our gratitude to awaken praise and renewed enthusiasm for our ministry of anointing our brothers and sisters with hope. May we be priests whose lives bear witness to the compassion and mercy that Jesus alone can bestow on us. So dear lay faithful, dear listeners, continue to challenge me and my brother priest to be better. That's a good thing to do. Uh, but I can also ask if there's a way you can uh, find an opportunity to encourage and thank your priest, as so many of you do so often. We're so grateful to you. That's always a great help also. They do so much. In, in my position, I get to see the very best of the priesthood. You know, right. I get to see this the Holy Father first to work without fanfare. Right. You know, it is, yeah. it's a blessing to see that. So I would encourage people also, please, you know, reach out to your priest. That, that would be great. Bishop, many schools start back on August 26th. I can't believe we're in the same month as school starting. I feel I like know. we just <laughs> closed school out, but here we are. Uh, and this begins a new phase of life for many little ones and for you know older students in high school and so on. They're one year closer to being out on their own in the, in the world. Uh, you I remember that time in your own life, but what is your message to students and to parents who yeah. are going through some some stresses these days? I always remember when I was a, a kid and you saw the first back to school ad. <laughs> you were like, yeah. oh no, I can't believe it. I used to hate seeing that first commercial. <laughs> but then I think most kids get to the point, you, you want to get back with your friends yeah. and the routine. No, I, you know, I always try to say that uh, for students and for teachers, um, a new school year is a new opportunity. And it's, it's, it's very spiritual in a sense. It's what God does for us. You know, you have to leave whatever, you know, mistakes or maybe failures of the past academic year uh, behind you. And you approach this as a new moment in your life, a, a new opportunity. You're not the same person you were when you were a sophomore or when you were in sixth grade or whatever. You're, this is a whole new opportunity and to make the most of that and, and to see it as, as new life. I always say to our students who are going to college uh, for, the, for the first time, and I, I mentioned this before, I give them a crucifix. Bring Christ with you. Don't leave your faith behind, because if you do, you'll crumble. Um, and it's the same thing with any of our students. You know? uh, you, you're to excel to the best of your ability in your academics, to use the gifts that God has given to you, but to grow as a person, you know, a, a person who's faithful to God, to God's ways, and who, who are finding opportunities to serve, uh, to serve others, and especially those in most need. So for all our teachers and students who are uh, beginning a new school year, I wish them uh, abundant uh, blessings and uh, many uh, new opportunities uh, for them. And uh, I'm sure many of our parents are welcoming this opportunity also. And as folks are getting ready to go back to school, if you want to uh if you have any pictures on social media, you want to tag us so we could you could share those. You could also email any of those great pictures of, you know, shopping for school supplies or that first day info at Arlington org. Bishop, you have 16,500 followers and growing, which is really impressive. And it's been uh, one of the fastest growing platforms we actually have. Uh, what inspired you to get on Twitter and why did you choose to manage it the way that you do? Hey, I, I, I thought getting on Twitter would be another opportunity of communicating with the faithful and a, a spiritual message. I don't use Twitter for any other thing other than spiritual purposes. And so it, as, a, as a priest, most of my uh, priesthood as a young priest, I was always the celebrant uh, of the 6.30 a.m. Mass. And so I was in a great uh, pattern of, because it was 6.30 in the morning, of 
preaching a homily at the weekday mass, but it was very to the point uh, because people were getting ready to go to work and it was, you know, a thought for the day. Maybe this is what God wanted you to hear. So I used the Twitter account for the same purpose. You know, I, I look at the readings the night before and I say a little prayer, Lord, help me to maybe use uh, this tweet uh, to help others to hear the message you want them to hear. So it's not about me. It's what hopefully just the instrument for what the Lord wants people to hear. So I, I reflect on the reading of the day and, you know, through prayer, I come up with a thought for the day and share it with, with the faithful. Uh, and, you know, allow God to use it for whatever purposes uh, he, he intends. So I hope it is a help to people. It's a help to me because it, it, it gets me to reflect on God's word and also gets me to be uh, pretty concise because you're only allowed so many uh, words in, in the tweet. So it, hopefully it's just a help uh, to help uh, the Lord speak to his people's hearts. Why do you think people are responding so well to it? I would think that, you know, I, I, you know, from, I think, much of social media, including Twitter, uh, there's, there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of harshness. Uh, that's why I try to stay away from that part of it. And I think maybe once in a while when people see that there's no harshness here, there's just words of encouragement uh, and spiritual uh, advice or help, it's, it's probably welcomed because, unfortunately, it, it's not the, the norm. So maybe because it's it's something different. All right, Bishop, we have a couple questions from the faithful. Kathy asks, Bishop Burbage, how do we walk our brothers back to the church who have been victims of sexual abuse by priests and still live in pain as they have seen the church leaders at the highest levels turn a blind eye? Yes, and thank you for that uh, concern, uh, Kathy, for uh, the victims of sexual abuse. Uh, they're always in our hearts and thoughts and minds. And we know that uh, the tragedy has, has called, caused deep wounds. And so all we can be is, a, is an instrument, a companion uh, of helping uh, in, in that journey uh, towards healing. And at some point, it may be uh, to invite them you know, to participate again fully in the community uh, of, of the church, uh, which is Christ, who loves them who never abandons them and who's there to strengthen and console them. But uh, we always have to be so uh, respectful of where that individual may be in that faith journey, in that process. And we, 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 have to, we can only accompany them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that, that, that takes you know, our, our continued uh, willingness and, and desire and expression of that, but certainly in their, in their time. And one question, just if I could add, you know, Kathy, um, a lot of people wonder, well, what's changed? Well, if you want to see some of what those changes are in the office we have established for victim assistance, uh, you can go to arlingtondiocese.org slash child protection. We have all the resources there, the letters from Bishop Burbage and the different things that we've done to both protect children, report abuse when it happens, as well as assist victims in their healing. So again, arlingtondiocese.org slash child protection. There's a lot of great resources that person might want to look at. Uh, Leonard asks, on the last podcast, you mentioned the diocese had an incoming class of 13 seminarians. I always feel like there's a round of applause in the background of yes. that, that quote every time we have it, but uh, is there an approximation? Or, um, yeah, is there an approximation available of those in formation for consecrated life and or religious orders? Right. So there are currently, to our best understanding, uh, seventy one in formation uh, for religious life from the diocese of Arlington wow. that we are uh, aware of. We can. The, it's easy to track the seminarians because they're studying for the Diocese of Arlington, so right. they come directly through us. Right. You know, where someone who is entering religious life may go directly to the Franciscans or the Dominicans oh, yeah. or the okay. Oblates or, or whatever. So there is the possibility, uh, because of their connection to community, they did not necessarily go through us. So it could be more. We may, it could be more wow. and more than that. Um, so as far as we know, two have entered religious life this year from the diocese, but if there are any more uh, listening to this podcast, yeah. let us know. Because in addition to doing a, a poster uh, each year with our uh, seminarians, asking people to pray for them by name, we also try to do one for uh, men and women 
who are entering religious life. That's so right. So that people can also uh, be praying for them. So yeah. if any of you are aware of, of someone we may not have come to our attention, let us know. But we, we again, thank these young men and women who are uh, so generously saying yes to God's call, whether it be a diocesan priesthood, uh, religious life uh, as, as a man or as a woman in uh, religious communities and congregations. Thank you for your generous yes. People here in Arlington are proud of you, and we're praying for you. And we have different retreats and programs for people to help discern not just you know diocesan priesthood, but religious life as well. You can go to the vocations page at arlingtondiocese.org to get more information on that. Bishop, any uh, final thoughts? It's been kind of a a lot of a lot of topics we've addressed here, but any final right. thoughts from you, and then if you would send us off with your no, prayers. No, thank you, Billy. Uh, just uh, wishing uh, God's continues blessings upon uh, all the faithful, all of our, our listeners. Uh, we know that we are living, as we uh, began this uh, podcast, in very unsettling times. Uh, so let's be united. Uh, let's be united in our prayer uh, that we are praying for the end of, of violence in our midst and, and praying for the grace we need to be instruments of peace. Uh, the Lord's instruments of peace, so together we can walk humbly with our God. Thank you for listening to the Walk Humbly podcast. Make sure you check out more episodes on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can follow me on Twitter at Bishop Burbage, where I offer gospel reflections each morning and share photos and updates of what is going on in the Diocese of Arlington. Stay up to date with news, event information, and inspirational content by subscribing to our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org.